So today our speaker will give us some economic updates. Uh, I don't know if you heard this gentleman before, but I did, and I thoroughly enjoyed how he gives us the economic update. Um, his name is Jordan Levine. He's the deputy chief economist at the California Association of Realtors, a statewide trade organization of, of real estate professionals with more than 190,000 members. <clears throat> Jordan helps to oversee all housing market research at CAR, including market statistics, survey research, industry trends, and policy analysis for CAR's legislative and governmental affairs efforts. Jordan has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a master's degree with Merit International Economics from the University of Sussex. Prior to joining CAR, Jordan worked in consulting as an economist and director of economic research, where he oversaw all research and economic analysis on California's economy and housing market, and regularly spoke to trade groups, public officials, businesses, and the media. Let's welcome Jordan, please. Thank you. Uh President Judy, I appreciate it. And I was joking with Dave that it's always good to be invited back to be with you all, because that means I didn't uh, screw it up too bad last year. Um, and, and I'm going to share my screen so that we can go through the forecast, which I just released with Leslie Appleton Young, our chief economist at the, uh, at the reimagine event about two weeks ago. And so these numbers are, are hot off the press. I've also sent these along. So if you want these slides later, you want to share them with clients, which I highly advise. I think now's the time, especially with sellers, to take a, a data-driven approach and really to kind of slide the, the data under their nose to really combat some misperceptions out there, particularly uh, on the sell side. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. But you'll have all these slides as the moral of the story. In, in case you, you want to use them. So um, I didn't know what, what metaphor to use for this. You remember this guy, Charles Dickens, the, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I used to have like, it was a, it's a time of mixed signals or, um, you know, like President Truman always wanted a one-handed <laughs> one economist because the economist would always come in and say, you know, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, um, that, that's kind of very much the mode that, that we're in right now. So I went with the best of times, worst of times, because I'm a Dickens fan. But, you know, if you, on the good side, if you look in the rear view mirror, a lot of the, the indicators that you'll see in the newspaper, on TV, et cetera, when it comes to the economic data are moving in the right direction. The economy is healing. It's healing in a broad-based way. We see that uh, whether we're talking about, you know, consumer spending or jobs or unemployment, um, interest rates, which are at all time lows, right? And so um, all of these kind of nerdy macroeconomic variables have, have shown some pretty robust and consistent progress over the last four to five months. And we see that playing itself out in, in our market, right? Buyer demand in particular uh, is, is very robust. We see home sales themselves are rising and we just put out our, our September press release and are now closing the books on October as we crunch those numbers and, and sales. And in fact, prices are, are both rising at a double digit pace, right? So again, even um, in our own neck of the woods from an industry standpoint, we see that uh, going down. There's also less distress out there, right? Whether we talk about uh, you know folks in forbearance, skipping rent payments, what have you, those numbers have all come down as well. So we see um, you know, good news in things moving in the right direction. We see the bad stuff um, getting smaller, right? And so that is all good. Unfortunately, I can't just kind of wrap up the presentation there and we all go out and, and enjoy and, uh, and, and kick our feet up and throw it into cruise control because there's still, uh, I think, a lot of headwinds. And that kind of is, is the double the double goal that I have today is to a show you that I think you know hopefully the worst is is behind us, but also to warn against um, you know going into celebration mode, going into cruise control mode. I still think it's going to be very much an elbow grease hustle type of an environment, right? Because even as things have moved in the right direction, you know you think about things like the labor markets. We still have um, almost 20 million people unemployed. That's you know much much better than it was three or four months ago, but it's still, you know, much worse than it's been at any other point in time outside of the last uh, four or five months. And, and again, even as more folks get current 
on those mortgage payments, we've still got about 350,000 folks that are delinquent um, on, on their home payments. We don't have any inventory. And for me, frankly, that's, that's the biggest concern that I have going forward for the housing market isn't that buyers don't want to buy. It's that, you know, where, what, where are we going to put these buyers into when there's no units out there on, on the market? And, and that's why I think we're seeing that sales um, aren't, aren't rising like they would be. In fact, if you look under the surface of these really robust sales numbers, what you see is that closed transactions aren't actually going up right now. They're just not going down the way that they typically would be at the end of a November. And I think that if we had actual inventory out there, we wouldn't just see them remaining unseasonably strong and not dropping off into November. We would actually see sales going up into November and December because people really want to buy. And, and so again, uh, that lack of inventory is really stunting the growth of, of the market. And the other thing is, you know, I think this has brought about some structural changes and, and we're going to have to grapple with things like migration and home ownership. Uh, so many people flooding into the market. It's really having an impact on housing affordability, which has been an ongoing problem and, and you know, could potentially get uh, even even worse. So that's kind of the, the broad overview is that things are going well, but we don't want to get too carried away, uh, patting ourselves on the back for having made it um, this far because we've still got a long road. To, so let's talk about uh, the good news first, because I think that there, you know, there is a lot to be optimistic about. Actually, today is election day. So before I, I go too far, I should tip my hat to uh, the election and say that, you know, if you haven't already, everybody should go vote in California in particular. We got a lot of real estate critical items, which I'm sure you guys, uh, by just by virtue of being on an economics presentation, are probably already uh, keyed into. But, you know, the, the outlook on what it means for the housing market, I think, over the short run is is not that much. And again, we just did an econ panel where not just myself, but I had uh, the chief economist or the deputy chief economist from CoreLogic, Selma Hepp as well as uh, Robert Kleinhens, who's a, a renowned economist in California as well. And it wasn't just me, but, but in general, the consensus was on that panel, you can go back and watch that, it's up on uh, the CAR website that you can watch on demand, is that elections don't really have a lot of short run impact on the housing market. These are really about setting the rules of the road. What happens with the GSEs? What happens with uh, you know who we appoint to the Federal Reserve? What happens with tax policy um, and how we favor or disincentivize home ownership and things like that. Um, we've done a lot of research on this. And when you actually go through and build statistical models to try and explain what happens in the housing market, you know, either by looking at prices or sales, once you start filling up the, the right-hand side of any kind of an economic model with uh, real life issues, you know, what's going on with my job? What's going on with my income? Where are rates at? What's happening with home prices? Were they going up or down? Uh, you know, all of that good stuff. Once you then put in a, a statistical proxy for an election, you see that there's not really a lot of statistical significance there. And that makes kind of intuitive sense, right? That's, that's kind of how we think about our housing uh, needs anyway. It's need driven. I just got married. I just had a baby. Uh, you know, my my girlfriend just kicked me out and I got to get a new uh, apartment. All of that stuff, uh, what's happening with my personal financial situation really dominates the housing consumption decision. And so I think that no matter what happens today or over the next, you know, couple of weeks as this all plays out, um, you know, the, the housing market is going to be more dominated by the fact that there's um, lots of buyer demand, very low rates and not enough homes to get these buyers into. And I think that will remain true over the next couple of months, um, you know, regardless of, of election outcome. And, and other good news, you can see that unlike the rest of the United States, we have really been moving in the right direction from a health standpoint. Um, I will put a little asterisk on there. If you look at the tail end of this uh, left chart, on cases, we have seen a tiny increase in cases uh, of late that has petered out over the last two or three days. And in general, when you look at other states, these numbers are moving in, in the wrong direction in many parts of, of the country. This is important because, uh, you know, the, the economy is, uh, you know, vulnerable to shutdowns associated with the health side. And I'm not, you know, qualified to make a prediction for you on what's going to happen with the health front, but I just bring it up because we, you know, A, the numbers are encouraging, but B, if something happens to these numbers that will have impacts on the economy one way or the other. If they continue to get better, the economy will continue to get better. If they start getting worse, then we're going to have to start to factor that into our models as well. 
so far so good though we're uh, we're doing a much better job at, at keeping a, a lid on on the health side of this the, the the kind of more optimistic economic side of this is is consumers right consumer confidence has um, had a bit of a bumpy ride after having the biggest declines we've ever seen in recorded history in march and april in may we hit bottom and we've kind of bounced around bottom but we have had a couple of months in a row where consumers have started to uh, feel better about the way things are going it's not just a gut feeling in fact if you look at the actual retail sales numbers consumers were back to pre-crisis levels of spending back in june and so for the last three months in a row we've actually set new all-time high levels for spending I know this is getting, you know, dangerously close to, to getting over nerd on you, but but it's important because when we think about, you know, GDP, which is just the measure of how big the overall economy is, and you think about that as a pie chart, um, can the, the, the kind of slice of the pie that's represented by consumers, it's almost 70%, right? Almost 70% of our economy is consumer driven. So business investment, uh, you know, accumulating inventories, international trade, government spending, construction, residential, non-resident, all of that stuff together is about 32% of our economy. And so what it means is that as go consumers, so goes, you know, the rest of, of GDP. And again, the good news there is that the biggest slice of the pie has started to grow again and, and set new uh, all-time high levels. If you scratch the surface on this number, um, you can see that there's a big gap in terms of what people are spending money on now versus before. And so it's been a very uneven uh, recovery, right? Service sector stuff where you need a face-to-face -face interaction uh, hasn't done as well versus goods that you can go order on Amazon and have show up magically uh, on your front door the next couple of days are doing much, much better. But overall, um, spending has, has quote unquote uh, recovered. We just got a new GDP number that in fact, um, the overall economy bounced back really strongly in the third quarter. So you can see first and second quarter, two uh, of the biggest declines or cumulatively the largest two quarter decline that we've ever seen um, in economic history has not been completely reversed, but we did get a 33% bounce back in the third quarter. We're not quite back to those pre-crisis levels, but you can see how three months of all-time high consumer spending uh, can really help to, to turn things around. This is kind of the tail of the tape of California's labor markets, um, summarized in visual form, if you will. So if you go back to the beginning of the crisis in February, we had about 17.6 million or so non-farm jobs here in California. By April, we had lost 2.6 million of those jobs in just a, a very short amount of time. But that being said, over the last five months, and we don't have the October number yet, but if we look at the um, you know nationwide stuff, it suggests that this will continue. We had already added back almost a million of those jobs that we had lost. So we still have about 1.6 million jobs to go, right? That's why I say we don't want to uh, get too carried away celebrating, but also a million jobs over the course of just a couple of months is, is nothing to sneeze at. We just had a a fairly big hole to to climb out of and we continue to make good progress there as well you see it in terms of unemployment too right we're uh down from a peak of almost 16 and a half percent to just 11 percent in california and the rest of the nation we've already dipped down below eight percent so things have gotten better and that improvement has been uh relatively consistent here's the thing that i think is a little bit closer to home right i bringing this, uh, and I think I brought this for you guys last year too, the kind of 55, 60 year history on interest rates, which are at uh, currently all time low levels. If I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but my dad was the guy, you know, out here in the early 80s, kind of in that 12 and a half percent range, uh, bragging to all of his buddies who got into the market at, you know, in the late 70s at 15 percent or something like that. And so um, this is a huge tailwind for us. I, I wish my poor dad was around today because he'd be one of these, uh, you know, buyers pumping up demand and, and trying to borrow as much money as he could get his hands on because, you know, uh, it's, it's never been more affordable to try and get your foot on the property ladder in California than it is right now from a, a cost of debt standpoint. And indeed, 
psychology is starting to turn around. Actually, this is a really interesting one. If you want to be a student of the crisis uh, and understand how we got to this kind of tight environment, uh, tight inventory environment that we're in, this is a survey of California consumers that we've been doing every month uh, for about a year. About a thousand consumers we out and ask, is it a good time to buy a home? Is it a good time to sell a home? Look at the left-hand side here. You can see that there's been uh, virtually no impact to folks wanting to buy a home. In fact, more people want to buy a home with the onset of the crisis than they did before the crisis, right? So um, the the COVID-19, the, the way that it's changed, the way that we live and work and all of that stuff, our homes are more valuable to us now than at any point in time. You know, home, the value proposition of home has really been uh, gotten a nice shot in the arm because of this crisis. And yet, if you look at the right-hand side, you kind of get a sense of how we got to this, you know, tight supply, high price. Uh, environment, there was a lot more logistical concerns and economic concerns for folks who wanted to sell a home. Those numbers were cut in half uh, with the onset of the crisis. We went from over 60% of folks saying that it was a good time to sell a home to less than 30% by uh, April of this year. A lot more to consider, right? Uh, a lot of that psychological scar tissue from 2008 where if you don't have a lot of experience with recessions, you think that recessions mean prices fall by 40 and 50 uh, percent. You have a lot of that kind of brother-in-law effect, the Kool-Aid effect or whatever, where um, you know, you're out at the barbecues, or I guess we're you know, at the virtual uh, barbecues now where folks are saying, you don't sell your home in a recession or you know, prices are about to tank and all of these kind of uh, preconceptions that folks have on top of just the logistical concerns. How do I get people in and out of my house? We can't have open houses now. What do we do with the PED form and all of the rules that were constantly changing? And so inventory took a huge step back, even as buyer demand took a big step forward. You can see that sellers are feeling better now. Uh, and we're starting to, to make some progress there that folks are looking around and, and realizing, oh my gosh, my neighbor's home sold you know, really fast. I looked at Zillow and they got a good price on it. And um, you know, the, the mechanisms of supply and demand, thankfully, are, are starting to work and they're, they're, you know, we're starting to overcome that. But I think that we still have a lot of work to do as real estate professionals um, on the sell side to really get the data in front of folks' notes, because I do think there's a lot of that psychological scar tissue or just conventional wisdom even that says, hey, you know, wait till the recession's over to sell your home. And, and in fact, when you look at the market, it's, uh, you know, not a bad time to be a seller out there. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons if you look at buyer demand, and this is through uh, November 1st, which was yesterday or two days ago, uh, you could see that although the yellow line has kind of trended down over the last two weeks, uh, it's trended down such that we're only running 150% ahead of where we were uh, at this time last year, down from about 200%. So more folks are requesting to look at properties. This is the index from showingtime.com of how many folks wanna go look at properties and do a private showing. And so even in the midst of a pandemic with double digit unemployment, we're running 150% ahead of 2019 levels in terms of folks asking to go look at properties. Same thing on the mortgage application side, right? You can see on the right-hand side here, those are the year-to-year -year increases in mortgage applications. We're still running almost 24% through last week ahead of 2019 levels. But take a look at the left-hand side because those are the week-to-week -week changes. And what you can see is that um, those numbers have, you know, they're below zero, which means that the number of applications being filed is actually smaller every week uh, than it was the week before. But on the right-hand side, we're still growing at an annualized pace of over 20%. What that means is that you know, the, the numbers are kind of basically plateauing when normally they're, they're dropping off in November. And so I just wanna throw that out there, even though we're seeing really strong numbers on the buyer demand side, we're not actually growing uh, the number of mortgage applications. And I think again, um, you know, that, that speaks to kind of some of the supply constraints out there. Other good news is that we've seen delinquencies start to peak. This is a slide that Selma Hep presented at our econ panel at Reimagine. And what she uh, reported was that 41% of COVID related forbearances here in California have already exited. So those, you know, she said 30% are now performing. So folks either got their jobs back or didn't need to, you know, they filed for forbearance just in case and didn't end up actually needing to, uh, to invoke it. But more importantly for me and encouragingly is that 6% of those uh, have actually paid off their mortgages in full. And for me, this is an encouraging sign that differentiates the current crisis from the last one. 
is that folks kind of have that option to sell the home, right? Is that, um, you know, maybe they did get into financial difficulty, they lost a job, they lost some income, spouse lost some income. But unlike last time, they didn't use their home as a bank account. They had some skin in the game, right? And and home prices have gone up such that they were able to sell that home and not have to just uh, strategically default. And that wasn't a choice that a lot of folks had uh, last time around. And, and something that makes me more optimistic when you look at the market numbers themselves they're very encouraging which is why you know my job is to try and tamp down expectations because if you just read the uh, press release that we put out you know you do you think it's time to pop the champagne we're at a uh, 21.2 percent year-to-year pace on transactions we're the closest to 500,000 home sales on an annualized basis statewide as we've been in basically about a decade. We had 489,590 existing home sales. Last month, home prices are rising at a 17.6% pace to a new all-time high of 712,430. Keep in mind, this is a median price here in California. That means that half the homes are more than 712,000, uh, you know, even though some of that is due to us selling more homes at the top end of the market, you do see the three, five million plus category doing particularly well. Even when you strip away that kind of mix of sales, you're still seeing actual honest to goodness values rising by seven, eight, nine uh, percent. And and a huge part of that is on the inventory front, right? Two months of supply statewide, a median time on market, and that's the time from when it go uh, lists to when it goes pending was 11 days, right? And again, this is the median. So that means that half the uh, homes that closed last month went pending in less than 11 days. As a result, you don't see a lot of discounting out there. 100% was that median sales to list price ratio. So again, these are the types of stats you wanna slide in front of the seller's nose whose brother-in-law just told them prices are about to tank and it's a terrible time to sell, right? Is that, um, you know, there is that that kind of psychology out there. And I think you really have to go, you know, that, that might be the conventional wisdom, but if you actually look at what's happening here, um, you know, you can see that you can expect to sell it quick and for a decent price without a lot of uh, wrangling over the price. That's the the takeaway that I'm getting out of these slides. When you look at, at how, you know, the data, the local data, but in some ways I didn't even have to because it looks almost the exact same as what I just showed you uh, statewide, right? Home prices up 14% year to year, sales up almost identical percentages, 21.4% increase in sales compared to where we were uh, last September, but the same exact inventory problem, right? Less than half as many uh, listings on the market as there was in 2019. And so time on market, very quick, very high prices relative to asking prices, very few folks actually discounting. Um, you know, I brought the stuff for, for the surrounding counties, but again, similar story, right? Prices up strong, sales up strong, inventory down. And so the market, uh, very competitive, same actually El Dorado County is even more up 81% in terms of closed transactions. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, Elk Grove, like some cities, right? You can see that that this is a, a pretty common theme, up 16% in sales, 12% in prices, no listings to speak of. Uh, Fair Oaks up even more than that, 26%, but again, only 61 homes out there um, at the end of September for folks to be able to, to buy. Rancho Cordova is up almost 80%. Um, Carmichael's up less only 14% increase. And again, um, only 60 homes for sale right now. And, and so you see the prices just uh, continue to go up. Roseville, similar story up 47%, no listings available uh, to speak of. So I'm, I brought all this local data just so you, that you didn't have to take my word for it. And actually you can download all these off our website. Every month we update about 400 individual cities. And so for me, these are the ones that you wanna print out and show to your sellers uh, you know, who, who may be on the fence because this, this might generate some of those, those listings and there's something to be said for being one of the only uh, homes available for sale in, in that price market. You wanna really get excited. I almost didn't wanna bring these uh, because you know, if you look at places like El Dorado Hills or like South Lake Tahoe, you know, we're talking about like triple digit uh, growth numbers. So the numbers are growing everywhere, but particularly in the you know, places where, um, you know, for folks from the Bay Area as an example, right? When you look at uh, 
a million bucks and what it gets you in San Francisco compared to what it gets you in El Dorado Hills or in Roseville or something like that. I think that that is playing a big part and giving us that kind of relative advantage now that folks have this flexibility and that our homes are more important to us than ever. And I think that's what you're seeing play itself out even more strongly in the local market um, than what you see throughout the rest of California. So that's the good news, right? Is that all the nerdy stuff is going in the right direction, the consumers, the unemployment, the incomes, the spending, the interest rates that my dad uh, would have killed for, and that's all showing up in our industry, right? But the reason why I don't want to get overconfident uh, is because there's still, you know, a lot of headwinds out there. And so, you know, again, when you think about um, unemployment, still almost 20 million folks on some form of unemployment or another. That's moved uh, in the right direction tremendously. So here's the like maximum number of concurrent unemployment claims at any point in time going back like 50 or 60 years. And you can see that, yes, uh, you know, at 18 and a half million or so, we've made dramatic improvements from when we were at almost 31 million people on unemployment. But we're still about three or four times worse than at any other time. We're just not five or six times worse anymore. And so um, huge amount of progress that we don't want to diminish or to scare you off of thinking that the recovery is coming to a halt or anything like that, but just more to, to manage the expectation that we still have a long uh, road to hoe on this or a lot of healing left to do or whatever your uh, favorite metaphor is is there. The other thing is, you know, I, I know that uh, over the last couple of days since I made this slide, the stock market's been a little bit more uh, wobbly. But, you know, I would I would kind of maybe play devil's advocate and ask whether the, the booming stock market is something to be celebrated or feared. And what I'm showing you here is is uh, basically a price to earnings ratio for the entire U.S. economy. I took the value of all publicly traded company stocks out there as measured by the Wilshire 5000. And then I just divided that valuation by how much money these companies are making as measured by corporate profits. And uh, if you look at this chart, which is, you know, very technical and nerdy, and I probably shouldn't even uh, have brought this out. But uh, if you look at this visually, what it tells us is that usually the stock market's worth about 10 to 11 times how much ever those companies are making at any given point uh, in time. And when you look at the, the right hand side of this chart, what you can see is that the valuations that we're seeing, the rebound to 30,000 and all of that stuff that we've enjoyed um, hasn't necessarily been driven by the fact that those companies are all of a sudden making a boatload more money. Now, it's not to say that it's unsustainable. It might be that the, the earnings are right around the corner and that these ratios will start to get back in line as folks start to spend those dollars again. But I throw it out there as a, a potential imbalance that, that we need to worry about uh, as well. Closer to home, again, we're, we're nowhere near where we were back in 2009, uh, but we still have about six, seven percent of our mortgages in delinquency that, you know, translates to 350,000 homeowners. So we're not at all time high crisis levels, but at some point we're going to have to reckon and grapple with these missed uh, mortgage payments one way or the other. Someone's going to have to take the haircut. It's either going to be the investors, the government um, or the homeowner or some some mix therein, but there's still a big TBD uh, left left on that one. The other thing is, and this is what I alluded to earlier, is that even though sales, and these are our weekly uh, sales numbers that we've been doing that go right up through last weekend, you can see that we remain unseasonably strong, right? That you don't see through the end of October, the sales ta uh, tapering off the way that they normally would. But when we when we try and interpret the growth rates that I just shared with you, I think that this is helpful context to see the actual numbers of home sales because uh, what we're seeing isn't sales actually going up. It's sales that aren't going down the way that they normally would. That's a good thing, right? We'll take sales, you know, the buying season stretching way out into the winter, but I think it underscores how much the inventory situation is holding us back because I think um, otherwise you would have a lot of folks out there like your Ira Levines who want to just uh, grab the 2.8% mortgage interest rates with both hands and and run with it, right? But uh, but there's no units for them to, to actually get into. And as a result, what you see, whether you look at it by kind of price segment or by region, you can see that we had a lot of momentum coming out of uh, May and June and even into July, big bumps in home sales. But as we've really exhausted the available supply, the, the growth rates have really petered out towards zero across almost every price segment, across almost every region of California as well. So the real heyday for growth was happening, you know, a few, a few months ago. And that's because, again, when you look at these and these are the weekly numbers through last week as well. 
we haven't seen an increase in the number of new homes going onto the MLS every day. We've basically uh, been flat for about three, four months consecutively. And look at the listings numbers. This is all of Central Valley, but you can see that you know listings, this is total actives. They don't usually peak in April, right? Um, and so all of this great sales growth that we've enjoyed has purely been burning off the inventory that was sitting out on our shelves and not because we're constantly replenishing uh, with new product onto the MLS. So there's you know a little bit more than half maybe uh, as much as what there was, but look at it by price range, right? And this is why I worry for the owner occupant segment. You look at the the numbers below even 800,000 and the number of actives are, you know, have just dropped off tremendously. We're not replenishing. And so we have had tremendous growth in home sales, right? But it's come almost entirely at the cost of active inventories. And we're just not listing enough properties to be able to maintain this pace of sales growth that we've enjoyed up until this point. And therefore it's you know not surprising that pendings are, are relatively flat. Again, they're not dropping off the way that they normally would, but I think we're missing a huge opportunity where they could be uh, you know, still powering a kind of V V shaped recovery. It's all uh, supply driven. So when you look at prices on a per square foot basis, they're rising steadily and consistently in terms of closed sales. Same thing for those active listings. I brought just a, a smattering of, of competitiveness stuff because you can see the percentage of uh, closings that close below list price um, is falling, right? There's fewer homes discounting. And so again, you wanna take that data, you slide this under the nose of those sellers who, who've who listened too much to their to their brother-in-law or what have you, because it's, you know, these all suggest that it's a favorable time. And one thing that I would throw out there is when you look at the, the percentage of active listings that have actually been reduced, something, uh, you know, suggests there that you might wanna look at whether it's priced right, because the ones that are selling are having fewer discounts and maybe you know we might be over aggressive or something like that because the ones that remain that haven't sold in the 11 day median time frame you do see more of those having to discount to me that suggests that there might be um, some over optimism on the you know there's like a survivorship bias is what the econ nerds would call that is like that uh, something's up with those ones that that haven't sold yet and and maybe i would suggest potentially looking at the price because everything else suggests that um, you shouldn't be seeing a lot of discounting and the homes are selling fast unless it was uh, specific to to something on on that listing and you can see time on market very low uh, by price range falling across almost every price category same with every region too and so uh, you know even as things have looked really good I would say that we still have some challenges and don't want to uh, over celebrate you can see that realtors are still feeling pretty optimistic. They're doing more listing appointments. This is a survey that we just closed over the weekend, talking to several hundred California realtors, um, more listings, more listing appointments. Uh, we still are at a fairly high level of folks responding that they entered escrow last week, right? And these are your colleagues. We actually had a, a jump over the last two weeks in folks reporting that they closed uh, a transaction. And so we're still feeling pretty good. And but you know, when we when we think about listings, there's a challenge there, and we're less optimistic about growing listings through last week uh, than we have been a few months ago. Same thing, therefore, I think with sales that you're seeing that that realtors are starting to realize that we can't put buyers into homes um, that aren't for sale. They're more bullish on prices, so I think we're all in, you know on the same page that this is a supply issue. But again, I just want to uh, warn you off being too too optimistic. So the forecast is for the worst to be behind us. We expect when you look at the econ numbers, the, the GDP stuff will grow by about 4.2%, but we still got you know a long way to go and it's not gonna be this kind of V-shaped bounce back when you do the annual average on the unemployment rate, as an example, we still have about a 7% annualized number. Things will you know start the year about eight, 9% where we are now and continue to get better but we're not gonna immediately jump back down to the all-time lows of three and a half that we were at in, in 2019. From a housing standpoint, we do think that there could be some foreclosures coming down the pike, uh, potentially as many as 60,000 of those 350,000 delinquencies may not make it. And we do think that that will have impacts on prices. Uh, but the reason why we're more hopeful this time around than we were in say 2008 is because we learned a lot of important lessons. The government's a lot more on board this time than they were last time around. You see that with the forbearances even being an option. The fact that these people who are in forbearance have uh, five-year 
workout periods instead of just asking them to show up on day one of the seventh month with a, a you know a balloon payment of, of six months missed mortgage payments and things like that we also just didn't have the fundamental issues in the mortgage market that we had back in 2005 six seven you guys remember the the ninja loans right the no income no job or asset kind of take my word for it uh, type of loans, the option arm loans, where I wasn't even covering my mortgage interest. And I woke up one day and magically saw my mortgage payment double uh, and decided to walk away from the home, the, the period in time when I was using my home as my uh, bank account. And I bought a boat and took my family to Europe and did all that kind of crazy stuff and took all the skin out of the game, such that when things um, started to look bad, then I made the calculation that my credit score would recover faster than my home price. We don't have all that kind of stuff this time around. And so, you know, it doesn't mean that we're going to be immune to the economic effects of this crisis, but it means that we're in a better position to be able to deal with them and not have a cascade into that kind of snowball effect that really drove uh, a really disproportionate uh, impact last time. So just to kind of um, back that up, if you will, if you look at the volume of cash out refis, right, this is the my home is my bank account chart. Uh, you can see that those numbers are much smaller. In fact, on a higher price point, if you actually work this out as a percentage of the value of the underlying properties there, um, nowhere near the amount of liquidating of home equity that we saw last time around. And so again, you don't uh, you don't foreclose on a home that you have equity in, even when times get tough, you lose your job, you have equity in that home, you, you get out from under it, right? And you maybe even make some money in the process and improve your uh, financial situation. So that's a reason to be optimistic. Look at the option arm numbers, right? If you go back to 2005, those were almost half of all the loans being originated, right? The five one option arms where you didn't know what your payment was gonna look like uh, a year from now, a much, much smaller proportion of the market today and has been for the better part of the last decade. Uh, so we don't have that systemic issue. Household balance sheets were in much better shape. We uh, went from a period in time where we had more um, debt and financial obligations. Both of these are measured as a percentage of income. Um, than at any point in time to not just at pre-crisis levels, right? If you look at the right-hand side of these charts, we entered this crisis with the lowest levels of debt and financial obligations that we've seen in decades. Uh, households actually had savings rates again. We remember those from uh, from the 80s, but uh, but we're starting to see that those were were a thing again. And again, this doesn't immunize us from the, uh, maybe that's a poor metaphor to use, but it doesn't uh, insulate us from negative consequences of, of an economic crisis, but it does put us in, in better shape to be able to, to not have a cascade. The biggest thing I think that we had going for us is that we didn't enter this thing in a housing bubble. So this is showing you the median priced homes mortgage payment, taking into account whatever rates were at these various points in time, and then dividing it by what the typical household in California actually makes. And what you can see is that um, these numbers weren't abnormally elevated. Yes, 43% of median income being consumed by the median priced home is higher than what you'd see in most other states. So if I threw up like the, the you know, Arkansas chart or the Arizona chart or Nevada chart, this line would be higher, right, than those areas. It's more expensive to live in California than it is in these other states, but it's not abnormally um, inflated, right? In fact, I would argue that we were back to our kind of historic levels of unaffordability. This is about as good as it gets in California uh, going into this. And so we didn't have this kind of huge exposure where home prices were way too high relative to what people were, were making out there. And that helps us as well. And so, um, you know, when you look at our baseline forecast for 2021, well, A, if you look at what we expect for 2020 is that when the dust settles on November and December, that will end up with home sales that were essentially flat or even up a tiny bit from where they were uh, in, in 2019, which given the huge 40 and 50% declines that we saw back in March and, and April and even into May is pretty incredible that it took uh, you know about seven or eight months and, and that was all it took to, to claw back those um, unprecedented declines, it's a totally a supply driven show. And that's why we have median prices going up by 11.6% on an annualized basis this year. And that that growth more importantly will continue into next year. So if you look at our forecast for sales, 412,000 home sales, which some people think that's a conservative estimate, but I would argue that 412,000 would be the best number we've seen in you know four or five uh, years prior to, to this. We have home prices continuing to go up as well, 4.4% 4 .4 
average values will probably go up more than that. But what we expect to see is some shifting away from that 5 million plus, which has just been on fire up to this point, at least somewhat back towards that retail uh, you know, owner occupant segment as some of these sellers do get that data slid in front of their nose and decide to uh, to throw their homes up on the market. Of course, this is all predicated on assumptions. These are the assumptions that underlie that baseline forecast that we're going to have a vaccine sooner than later over the next six to nine months or something like that, that we see uh, a slight increase in our cases this winter, but nothing to where we have to do a three to four month uh, shutdown the way that we did over the summer, in which case the economy continues to grow, incomes continue to grow, and we do see some foreclosures, but that next year they represent uh, 8% of the market or less, in which case we think that those individual foreclosed properties will carry a discount of uh, 10% or or less, right? That we will have some issues, not everyone's going to be able to bounce back, but that it's going to be more manageable this time around. Of course, we do have a worst case because this is uh, it's a terrible time to be a forecaster, I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, and this is the first time we've ever had scenarios, but we do have a worst case scenario, which suggests that we don't have, um, you know, we're not able to get back to normal health-wise until at least the second half of the year or even beyond, um, that we have a, a resurgence in the next couple of months that really does cause us to close the economy back down, in which case we don't have GDP growing next year and actually incomes falling instead of rising. If that plays itself out, we see foreclosures being much bigger uh, problem, right? The government can't just step in and fix the problem when the economy is still getting worse. It's one thing to help bridge folks into better times. It's another thing to just be the full uh, buttress of the economy. And so in that case, we see foreclosures increasing to be about 30% or so of all transactions next year and carrying much bigger discounts uh, because there's a lot more of those distressed properties that folks are trying to uh, to get out from under. If that plays itself out, you're talking about a forecast where um, sales actually go down by about 12% next year and the prices fall by about 16%. That's our, our kind of worst case scenario. I will just point out that, you know, even in our worst case scenario, 30% yeah. uh, of the market being foreclosures, we're talking about a worst case scenario that's roughly half as bad as what it was in 2008, nine and 10. That doesn't mean, um, you know, that we're immunized and you can see our baseline is much better than that. We even have a best case scenario that's, you know, kind of, looks at this idea that maybe this lack of inventory doesn't hold us back and that somehow it just only shows up in higher prices and that we're able to continue to you know grow sales with all this great buyer demand even with a thin level of inventory in which case we get up to 430,000 transactions next year uh, and prices grow even more uh, cresting 717,000 on an annualized basis and so i think that uh, we've been wrong upside thus far that our, our baseline scenario has been too pessimistic and so you know it's not unthinkable that we see an even better forecast than what our baseline showed you here but for me the more important thing is that even in our worst case scenario we're talking about something that's less than half as bad as what it was in 2009 and likely will be uh, even less severe than that and so for me that's that's kind of talked your ear off and you guys are probably gonna uh, pull the shepherd's hook out on me here at any any moment, but uh, I, I would just put a bow on it by saying that yes, things have gotten a lot better. Keep in mind when you read the paper that a lot of that stuff is backward looking, the increase in sales and all of that stuff, and that we still have uh, a long way to go. I am hopeful, honestly, that that this crisis actually kind of ushers in some advantages. And I think for places like Sacramento, we have a real opportunity, um, you know, with what we offer in terms of quality of life, with, uh, you know, size of home, with um, affordability and all that stuff. Folks who aren't, don't have a gun to their head, forcing them to commute into the uh, Embarcadero in San Francisco every day is going to be a real feather in the cap for, for regions like ours. Um, you know, I think it's an opportunity for us to, to kind of sort out some of the issues that have been facing California where we don't have the people uh, where the housing is and all of that stuff. And, and so for me, I think when you zoom out from this, even though we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, I think we have uh, a huge opportunity to, you know, have more stories like mine where you got guys whose dad didn't even graduate high school, but realized the American dream of home ownership. And that's what lets their kids kind of go to school, become econ nerds, and then uh, come deliver speeches like this one today, and and so for me, I'm 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 optimistic, cautiously optimistic, but uh, but things 
have moved in the right direction. And so I will leave it there. And if I haven't beat you into submission, I'm happy to entertain any questions if there are any. Hey, Jordan, we actually do have a couple of questions. Judy, did you want to say something before we moved into those? Oh, I just wanted to thank Jordan for the great information and, and keeping it local. Really appreciate it. And I love when you talk about your crazy uncle. Thanks. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Jordan. And we had a couple of these coming in and I know you addressed it at the beginning of your presentation, but will your slides be available? Yes, I've already sent them in. And so you guys are, are welcome to, to share these with whoever wants them. They'll also be posted on car.org. We also post uh, other speeches. So if you want updates on this stuff over time, just go to our website and like, um, it, it won't necessarily be local for you guys, but you can always get the updated unemployment and every, like we're doing speeches like this every week. So you can always get the latest and greatest stuff there too. Thank you for that reminder. We appreciate it. Um, and we do have kind of a, a three-part question from one of our, our very involved uh, lenders who's, who Great. serves as our affiliate finance chair this year, um, circling around rates and the Fed. So yeah. I'll read you what he wrote and you can address it um, how, how you see fit. With the Fed buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to keep the rates low, how much longer can they or will they continue to buy? So that's the first part of the question. Do you see rates continuing through 2021 to remain where they are now? I know you kind of talked about that just now a little bit. Yeah. And then do you see the Fed maybe changing their policy um, if inflation starts to exceed 2%? Great questions. Uh, perfect timing for this question too, because I actually just uh, a week before Reimagine, I did the the econ conference, the National Association of Business Economists, where all the the econ nerds kind of gather and and nerd out together on our spreadsheets. And two of the speakers there were from uh, the Federal Reserve. One was Jay Powell, the the Fed chair, and the other one was the head of the Chicago Fed, I believe. And uh, moral of the story is that they're even more kind of gung-ho support the economy than they have been. They actually unveiled new policy thinking where they're going to be even more accommodative uh, of growth. The Fed has what they call a dual mandate. So they're supposed to both uh, keep unemployment low and also keep inflation in check. And what they said is that they care more about unemployment than they do about inflation. And, and so they're gonna actually even allow uh, inflation to creep up even more than what they have in the past and that they think they can get away with uh, having a little bit more inflation without having real kind of snowball effects that take us back to the kind of um, Volcker era days where we really have to ratchet down on, on inflation. And so for me, what that means is that they're going to continue to accommodate even beyond when they normally would have started to try to take the punch bowl away, if you will. And, and so I think that the rates are going to stay, um, I think they're going to stay low. And I think that most of the governors that I've heard are, are fairly on board with this idea of being um, more tolerant of slightly higher inflation. And I think that it's kind of practical in the sense that no matter what they've done up to this point, we haven't been able to get over 2% inflation. And so they, um, you know, are just signaling a commitment to really um, being, you know, gung-ho supporting the, the economy. So I don't necessarily think we're going to see 2.76% mortgage rates for the next, you know, 12 months consistently, but I'd be surprised if they were, um, you know, over 3.1 or 3.2% or, or something like that at the end of the year. So I think that they're, you know, we're still going to be basically in an environment where you can channel that like inner Ira Levine and, and recognize that the, the rates are still very, very uh, favorable from for home buyers. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for addressing those questions, Jordan. We did have um, another one come in um, regarding retail spending. So mm -hmm. do you think that surge in retail spending is a result of recovery or is it a result of people allocating their spending as they reallocating their spending from things like travel that isn't necessarily as easy. So do you think that spending is gonna to continue to surge as we open more market segments? Yeah, I think as the economy gets better, as more folks are earning money and working, right? Then that you know, typically is highly correlated with them spending more money. I will say that part of the recovery up to this point has been um, government fueled, right? We all got thousand dollar checks in the mailbox and all of that stuff. We got um, expanded unemployment benefits that are letting us continue to maintain consumption. We have people like independent uh, contractors, realtors getting unemployment that were uh, not able to. Those PUA benefits are running out, um, you know, and so eventually that's going to detract from growth if we don't get more 
um, support. I think there's still, you know, a, a big role for for the government to play last time. And I would just, you know, hopefully we we have, you know, learned the lesson that it's pay now or pay later, right? That when we left everybody to kind of fend for themselves in 2008, 9, and 10, we didn't save the economy um, any any pain by saying that we're not going to step in and, and sort this out. We ended up having a much bigger crisis that the government had to step in and pay for uh, anyway. So it's a lot a lot cheaper to prevent a full a full-blown crisis than to recover from one and and so that's kind of i guess me uh hoping that that things will get better but i do think that there is a risk to spending if we don't um continue to to fuel that but there's a lot of folks who um are relatively unimpacted by by this crisis right that that's where the k-shaped recovery comes from if you can you know, you can't clean a hotel room or serve a meal remotely, but you can still be an econ nerd and do your spreadsheets and get those sent in. And and so, you know, that is providing a backstop to the level of spending because those folks are largely still working and maybe even uh, doing better because they're not out traveling and spending all that money going to Hawaii or whatever else they do. Great. Thank you so much, Jordan. That's uh, all the questions I've seen come in. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's always a blast. I appreciate it.